It was always a man's car. Like a jukebox on wheels. It's got more grunt. It makes me feel like I'm on top of the world. Ice cream and candy floss pink. The scrapyards liked them. They were full of them. It was a beautiful family car. Well, the Vauxhall Company in its very early days made tugboat engines. I mean, it was called the Vauxhall Ironworks then. It was on the Thames in the Vauxhall Bridge area of London. And it, like most companies in those days that were in engineering, it, it, these newfangled cars became a centre of attention. So they turned their hand to making a simple car, uh, which they did, and, uh, and that was produced in 1903. So, so that was the first Vauxhall. Then in 1905, uh, the, the business was growing. They actually moved out to Luton, out into the country as it then was. And then they entered an era where really Vauxhall became one of the great luxury marks. Uh, and uh, this all occurred because of uh, the emergence of a very brilliant young engineer called Lawrence Pomeroy. And he produced a car called the Prince Henry after the Prince Henry of Prussia trials where the car was very, very successful in competition. Well, the Prince Henry was one of the most important cars for Vauxhall in the early days, and it really started as a competition car, quite literally. Um, competitions of those days very much sold cars, so uh, the, the Prince Henry of Prussia trials were the great event, uh, and this was really just a case of getting from A to B with a degree of reliability. I mean, speed even wasn't the essence. The roads were grim, everything was pretty diabolical, so it was, it was being there at the finish that counted. Um, Pomeroy designed this car uh, specifically for this particular competition. It had a, uh, a very radical V grill, as we would call it nowadays, a V radiator, which made the car uh, look extremely handsome and extremely rakish. From there was spawned a, a whole bunch of great sporting cars and really great luxury cars. And I think that surprises a lot of people nowadays to know that Vauxhall really was up there with Rolls Royce and Bentley as, as the provider of uh, some of the most uh, mouth watering machinery that was available in the 20s and 30s. The clientele was uh, obviously very rich and uh, mainly people that could afford to buy what was a very expensive chassis and then have a, a very expensive bespoke body put on it. And really the uh, Vauxhall sales network spread into some of the most surprising places. One of our biggest export territories was Russia. And the Imperial House in Russia, the Romanovs were regular users and had a huge garage or stable, I guess in those days, of Vauxhall cars. And we had uh, mechanics and sales representatives in Moscow and in St. Petersburg uh, servicing this sort of client. In 1914, um, Mr. Higginson, who was the manufacturer of the Autovac, which was the, like the petrol pump of modern times, it supplied engines with fuel, um, very important man, and he needed a car to win at Shelsley Walsh, which was a hill climb in Worcestershire and was the leading competition event of that particular time. Well, Vauxhall Motors undertook to make him this car, and believe it or not, in three months, they produced the first 3098. It's the sort of thing you couldn't do these days because you can't design a car from scratch in three months, including the chassis, the engine, and all the, all the running components. So Vauxhall Motors did what was then uh, an amazing feat, an impossible feat now. It would outperform anything else on the road when you consider that the normal cars were Austins, Morrises, Kleinos and things like that with a maximum speed of about 55 or at the most 60 miles an hour. The 3098 was guaranteed by the company to do 100 miles an hour but you had to loan it back to them for a couple of days while they prepared it for this, uh, this, uh, this, this, this event and they took the windscreen off, perhaps they made, maybe took the headlights off and that sort of thing. But it would do 100 miles an hour and they gave you a certificate to prove it. It was always a man's car. It was the man of the house's car. He would drive it normally on the roads, he'd go to the office or do whatever he had to do with it. Um, at the weekends, he could easily take it and perform well at places like Brooklands in a sprint or, 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 or a short race and drive it back home again with no trouble at all. My own car ownership started with Austin 7s and Bullnose Morrises and I eventually got up to a Bentley, a three litre Bentley, which I liked that very much. But then I bought this car here in 1969 and ran this car and the Bentley 
together for about three years. One had to go. And this car I kept because it seemed to be a better car. It got what we call, it's got more grunt. It takes off, goes, it, it takes off the mark better. And so we kept this car instead of the Bentley. It must have been the best car Vauxhall ever made. 1925 was a really uh, momentous year, a watershed year for the Vauxhall Motor Company because that was the year that General Motors of the United States bought Vauxhall. I'm not sure they knew what they were buying, but certainly General Motors had this impression that they wanted to get a foothold into Europe and at the time Vauxhall was struggling and the two came together. And I think probably just as well because in the recession of the 30s, I guess it's doubtful that Vauxhall could have survived making just purely luxury cars. Now, of course, General Motors had aspirations to uh, build cars literally for everyone. And the first manifestation of that was in 1931 when a brand new small Vauxhall came out, the Vauxhall Cadet, and that was sensational. Here was a, a hitherto luxury car manufacturer now making cars that literally everyone could afford. Now, by the time we arrive at the 10-4, Vauxhall was a mass producer of motor cars and a very serious competitor in the United Kingdom market. If you look at the 10-4, it's got a number of very novel features. For a start, it's the first car in the United Kingdom to have a unitary construction body, or what we might call nowadays a, a monocot. Uh, it's also got an overhead valve engine, it's got independent front suspension, it's got hydraulic brakes, and it's the first production car to offer metallic paint. <laughs> On the roads of every motoring country in the world and now run the two new models of the famous Vauxhall Company, the two and a quarter litre Velox and its younger brother, the one and a half litre Wyvern. Both embody all the latest features of the high class motor car. The independent suspension system is progressive, automatically meeting surface conditions. Obviously there's loads of room for luggage. The trunk also accommodates the spare wheel. Note the press button fuel filler cap. The screen wipers, when switched off, automatically rest at the bottom of the screen, thus overcoming one of the minor annoyances of motoring. After the war, we started to make some cars, started with the L-Type, but principally the first car where I think people really go, wow, and look at some of our cars, is the Vauxhall Wyvern. It came out in 1953, and it was the first car where not only did we have North American engineering, but plainly we had North American styling, and uh, my father had one, and I can remember being enormously proud of this car and polishing all the chrome, of which it has quite a lot. It was an amazing car. It drove very well. It was a beautiful family car, but it had that North American sparkle, and of course in the 50s, and, and indeed in the 60s, the United States was where it was at with car design. This factory planned to build a car utterly new, yet worthy of a long history of fine engineering. Better than anything that had gone before, different from all the others. A car that would look ahead from 1958. But England can't provide all the testing grounds that modern car designers need. So they put their prototypes in an air freighter and headed them for the autobahns and rugged mountains of Europe. It's lucky these men are good drivers as well as good development engineers. See what I mean? This is the Vauxhall Cresta PA, 1958. It's the oldest known one in the world. When the public first bought these cars, I think they thought they were film stars themselves. Big bloody yanks and chewing gum, yang yang. I don't particularly like the yanks, but I like the cars. Lots of crown, like a jukebox on wheels. Fins sticking up at the back, Batman. But some of the real unusual things about the car was the curved glass. It's a proper American idea. And the early one like this, had three rear windows. Uh, belt your knee every time you open the door. That was good, you never forgot that. That was good, that was. Especially if you'd had a couple of pints, it'd be it sort of sobered you up a bit. Yeah, that was good, that one. And then, of course, a lovely big back seat if you sort of picked up a girl. You was sort of all right there, you know, as well. Surely this is a great day for any family. The finer the car, the sweeter the joy. And there are no sweeter lines in fine cars than this new Vauxhall Cresta shows. 
This is motoring in the modern shape, graced in the colours of tomorrow, set off in its distinctive style by bright work of chrome and stainless steel. This is the shape that is low, wide and handsome. Vauxhall have marketed themselves very contradictorily. If you take the 50s, where they produced these ice cream and candy floss pink cars, modelled on, obviously, GM in America, they then marketed them to the roast beef and Yorkshire pudding and the pipe smoking brigade. And unlike most other family cars, they included large numbers of people in their advertising, and the people are ultra-respectable. So you get grey-haired businessmen, golf clubs, sitting inside bright pink Cadillac-styled PA Vauxhalls. You get respectable ladies with white gloves loading luggage and shopping into the back of early victors. And there is no reference to the exciting styling, no reference to the transcontinental elements of the style at all in the brochures. They were almost perhaps ashamed of their styling and trying to pretend that you could still be very traditionally British and buy these extravagant and exuberant cars. Here's finger light control. Here's boldness in the details that count for so much. Here's a safe car with the unequal vision of a panoramic screen. Easy to park with full width rear vision. Satisfying in its interior appointments, especially in my lady's critical esteem. Everybody loved these cars, but the rust, tin worm, what we call it, that rust, I suppose, uh, terrible. Especially the back wings used to nearly fall off, used to flap along the road. The, uh, the petrol filler, another thing, there's a little drain, water drain there, and they used to block up and then the water used to fill up the petrol tank. So, you know, when you was ready to go, you couldn't bloody go nowhere. I like Vauxhalls because they're different. You know, the, everybody wring their heads off when you drive past. Nothing like it today on the road. The modern plastic rubbish don't appeal to me at all. This, this is the ultimate machine. In the 50, late 50s, Vauxhall uh, launched the Series 1 Victor, which is this car. It's a scaled-down version of a 57 Chevy, really. Uh, they were quite popular. They sold 400,000, nearly, um, and half of it, them cars went for export to, I think, uh, 83 countries. I think that these, this Vauxhall Cresta and, and the Victor done very well for Vauxhalls until they started falling to pieces. But went downhill then, <laughs> rapidly. The scrap yards liked them. They were full of them, stacked up there everywhere. Hundreds of them. <laughs> and there was more in the scrap yards than there was in the factories. <laughs> in the mid 60s, really, Vauxhall found itself in a position of building very worthy family cars, but they were four cylinder and six cylinder based, and they were quite large cars. And what was happening all around us was that other manufacturers were bringing out far smaller, far more fuel efficient and well packaged cars. And the solution for us was the Vauxhall Viva. Oh, come on, boys, move it out of the way. Morning, David. Where's the tea? It won't be a moment, Joe. Good big doors, open wide, too. That's a help. Can I have a working light, please? <clears throat> Thanks. Now I want to show the bucket type front seats, the instrument panel, the parcel shelf. I like this. Yes, the two color trim and the new armrest. Here, yeah, where's all that going? In the boot. You'll never get all that lot in. The wrap around rear seat, the padded armrest. Okay, if I try for size, Joe. Help yourself. Biggest cameraman in the business. See? Bags of room. Polishes itself. Magic mirror, they call it. Up to 80. No trouble at all. Big brakes. How's about that then, Joe? Four speed all synchro gearbox. You know, I think I'll get a Vauxhall Viva myself. The Viva moved Vauxhall into a new area and their marketing right from the start was very safe 
and as with previous marketing, very family orientated. So that their materials showed happy families. There's one brochure I recollect with a father looking at his son with a small model boat, mother smiling proudly at her daughter. You have shots of Aviva against a timbered building. You have shots of Aviva's on holiday. But of course, when they were on holiday, they were on rather windy beaches in England. They weren't in exotic locations. This is certainly the car for men who want to get there. But as all days are not summer, not all drivers care so much about making fast journey time. The man who drives for economy, with some care, can get 50. And money saved on petrol for many families today is money to spend on other needful things. Things for the home, maybe. Viva GT was basically a ordinary Vauxhall Viva, but with all the Victor mechanicals squeezed into it, modified and uprated. It was basically a big car inside a small body. And it was the first true 100 mile per hour family saloon. The best thing about the Viva GT is its speed. The torque from the engine really does thrust you back into the seat. I fell in love with these cars when I was 14 years old. When I was able to drive, when I was 17, I couldn't afford to buy a Viva GT not afford to run one either. The insurance costs were colossal. They went a little bit overboard on the styling. The matte black bonnet and the silver wheels and four chrome tailpipe for the exhaust was a bit boy racerish for 1968. What we've got to realise is that this car was launched when the Morris Minor was still on the road and was a normal everyday car and so a car that looked like this was a bit over the top. Motorsport beckoned to Vauxhall in the late 60s. Uh, it was something that many other manufacturers were successful with and it obviously had some effect on the, on the mark image. And really before the Viva and, and its sports clones, the Viva GT and then the Forenza, we didn't really have a car that was suitable for motorsport. <laughs> star of the Vauxhall range, she's an engineering thoroughbred. The direct descendant of a very successful motor racing team, the dealer team Vauxhall. It was a, really a General Motors policy of the day that said that uh, General Motors division shouldn't be directly involved in motorsport. So the way around that for the enthusiasts of the day was to get the dealers to go racing for us. So we formed a team called Dealer Team Vauxhall, DTV, and really, uh, we had an amazing driver, uh, a man with a great character called Jerry Marshall. And Jerry used to drive uh, the Viva GTs and then the Forenzas in what was then saloon car racing. And really, we became uh, synonymous with success in the saloon car field, with the, particularly with the Forenza. The involvement with motorsport was quite crucial. It's very difficult to evaluate in pound note terms what it does for you, but definitely people identify with a successful motorsport product, even if they are only able to afford the, the, you know, the ordinary version of the car. In the mid-1970s, Vauxhall really found itself in a, in a deep crisis. Uh, for a variety of reasons, sales were absolutely rock bottom. Uh, in fact, if I was with the company at the time. If I remember rightly, uh, we were down to about 7.5% market share. And really, I think General Motors had so many attempts at breathing life into Vauxhall that they really felt they should perhaps lock the door and throw the key away this time. So it was crisis time. Vauxhall looked towards the 1980s and introduced an entirely new range of cars, the Cavaliers. Uh, 
Uh, I joined the company back in 74. The Viva was coming towards the end of its life, really. And then we started to build the Mark I Cavalier. I suppose towards the end of the Mark I, these turned out to be rather desperate times with Vauxhall. We had to endure a lot of short time working, three day week. The scene was one of empty conveyors, glum faces. Um, I myself wasn't too happy. I was trying to say to get married at the time. Very difficult for me to do. But there was a project in the wind and it was a replacement, which was gonna be a Mark II Cavalier. It was almost as if, it was almost a different company. The car just took off. The most significant thing, it was a front wheel drive. Um, all our main rivals were still struggling along with rear wheel drive cars. The, the audio engine was a fuel injected, powerful engine, which made it very economical, it made it very competitive. I think it was a really user friendly car because it soon became a favourite of the fleets. Um, all the fleet buyers were going Cavalier. And when you consider that 75% of, of probably all major manufacturers, what they build go to fleet cars, that was a good competitive market to get in. Cavalier was also marketed as the family car. And if you bought a Cavalier, you were going to be very safe, very respectable, and you have cricketing scenes, for example, in modern Cavalier brochures. You have the very much the traditional staples of the English scene. No suggestion that if you buy a Cavalier that you're being at all radical. Nothing extravagant happened in a Cavalier. The, the Cavalier convertible is very much a collectible item now. Um, it's recognised throughout the classic car world as such. My passion for Cavalier convertibles probably dates back to when I was a young lad. Driving a Cavalier convertible makes me feel on top of the world. The hood's down, You've got a family of four in it, you know, off on holiday or just for a drink down the pub. You, you just can't beat it. Wonderful feeling. Wind in the hair, brilliant. When we were building the first Cavalier, I was at the very beginning of the process. I'm pretty sure I'm the only one that's actually been there throughout the three Cavaliers we've been building over the last 20 years. The modern Vauxhall is an extremely good vehicle. Uh, it's catering for the mass market. It's a different total market to that which Vauxhall's originally catered for. One may not think of Vauxhall as a luxury car. At that time, the Vauxhall was a really sought after car and an expensive car to buy. Quite different from today when it is the car for everybody.